Good morning, everyone. It's uh, my real pleasure to share this session dedicated to Asia and the Sino-American rivalry. Uh, it's a topic we have already partly discussed yesterday during our very substantive discussion. I hope that all of you had a good rest uh, during the night. We have um, uh, uh, 90 minutes to discuss uh, this, uh, this topic this morning. With uh, six panelists, I will introduce uh, uh, just, just after three set of questions I would like to, to raise. The very first one is about the nature of uh, this uh, rivalry and to try to identify the main fields uh, in which we could observe it. Is it in the military field? What about Taiwan, for instance? Is it more in the technological field? Uh, what about the chips, a topic we have already addressed uh, uh, yesterday? Just two examples about the, the way the discussion could, um, uh, could take. Second, I think we should explore in this discussion the consequences for the others. I mean, apart uh, the US and China, there are other very important um, strategic players in the region, namely Japan, Korea, uh, India, of course, and the ASEAN countries. So it's important, and that's, I think, the benefit from this panel to uh, add the different uh, viewpoints. And last set of questions, it is, I would say, the regional agreement, regional partnerships, uh, which do exist at the time being, or which will exist in the future. And obviously, in that, the military alliance, the AUKUS, is certainly a game changer uh, we, we should address as well as we did partly uh, yesterday. So with this uh, free, free set of questions, we have um, a lot of uh, things to, to be discussed. We will do so with um, six uh, panelists. The first one will be uh, Mr. Akita, who is uh, from Japan, who is a commentator uh, for Nikkei. He will be on Visio with us this morning. After that, I will turn to Renaud Girard, who is a senior reporter and war correspondent for um, Le Figaro. And um, Renaud will uh, speak about uh, China's attitude, China may be strategic mistake in the, in the region. After that, I will turn to Ambassador Li, uh, who is senior advisor of um, Kim and Chen and a former chief negotiator for the Co Korean EU FTA. And uh, I will turn after that with, um, to Mr. Nahayenayen who is the executive chairman of uh, SecureX System and the former national security advisor to the Prime Minister of India. We will continue our, our discussion with uh, Marcus Noland, who is the executive uh, vice president and director of studies uh, at the Peterson Institute, and Marcus is with us uh, on Visio. And we will finish the first round of the discussion after the exchanges with uh, Professor Wang Jizi, who participated in a um, previous session uh, yesterday and who is the president of the Institute <coughs> of International and uh, Strategic Studies at uh, Beijing University. So, let me start with um, Mr. Akita. Mr. Akita, the, the floor is yours. I have asked all the panelists to, to speak about uh, six, seven minutes before having exchanges and uh, turning to the audience. Mr. Akita, the floor Hi. is yours. Hi, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm sorry I couldn't come to the conference venue. Uh, actually, when I was uh, invited, I get excited and I check all the information about Abu Dhabi uh, from uh, uh, culture, restaurant, and food, and so on as well as conference agenda. So I hope I can uh, visit uh, Abu Dhabi in the future. So I yeah. will uh, finish my oh, no. first remark in six minutes. So I just want to make uh, three brief points. First point is about the changing nature 
of US-China rivalry. Second point is the prospect of that rivalry. And thirdly, lastly, about, is about what we should do to win this competition. So first uh, point, changing nature of US-China rivalry. Uh, before the pandemic, I think that the rivalry was more or less about competition over the high-tech and maritime security domain hegemony. But through this pandemic, now we have a very important new element to this rivalry. That is fierce competition over the political system. In short, uh, competition between communist party regime political system versus U.S. democratic system. So now uh, U.S. generally believe that communist party regime is part of responsible to this COVID situation in the U.S. or other country. And the U.S. believe that if communist party allows freedom of press or press freedom of uh, uh, expression, uh, maybe Beijing could have avoided uh, this situation and could contain the outbreak of the uh, infection in Wuhan at earlier stage. So U.S. perceived this situation as a problem of the political system. <laughs> and why, on the other hand, China believed that uh, U.S. current situation is largely due to the former Trump administration's way to handle the COVID. Beijing now expands the narrative that a communist party regime system is superior than US democratic system. So it seems to me that uh, now it is, uh, this rivalry is beyond high tech or maritime security, but also to do with the political system. This is the first point. That's the second point. What is the prospect of this rivalry? I'm afraid to say, but I think that Western countries are in a less favorable position and Beijing is in a much better position now. Let's look at the economic front. China has, China signed mega FTA agreement with 15 Asian countries last year, last year. It is called RCEP. Now China also applied the participation to TPP. And we cannot uh, underestimate China's willingness to enter TPP. On the other hand, US does not have any alternative economic strategy. Uh, US is not maybe willing to come back to TPP. So this is economic competition. And also on the military front, again, we have to admit that China is in a more favorable position as of today. Uh, China's military now deploys about five times more submarine aircraft planes and also warships than U.S. military deploys in, in the Pacific. And according to the projection of uh, U.S. in the PACOM, uh, 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 this military balance of power will shift toward China's favor more in coming years. So second point is that we are not in a favorable position now vis-a-vis -vis China. So that leads to my last short point. What should we do to win this competition? Obviously, we nearly need to have better common in the Pacific strategy to push back. Uh, we have in each individual country or EU now have it, their own strategies, but we have to have common strategy. But this is very, very difficult because uh, risk tolerance to uh, counter China largely differs depending on 
East Asian countries. For example, Japan and Australia can uh, accept highest risk to counter China because we are the treaty ally of US and we are the under the security umbrella of US. But on the contrary, ASEAN country, uh, relatively small and largely rely on China economically, cannot afford to resent China. So uh, accommodating all these Asian like-minded country and to proceed in the Pacific strategy is very, very difficult, but I don't think it's impossible. My conclusion is this. If we were to be, we were the painter, let's say, maybe we should pursue Giorgio Sula, pointillism painter's approach, rather than portrait painter approach. That is, uh, on canvas, we uh, placed dots on the important spots with a like-minded country uh, and accumulate those dots with a hope, with an aim to evolve to be uh, <laughs> ambiguous in the Pacific strategy. So that's dots includes high tech or supply chain or consequential digital rulemaking. So this is the approach rather than a portrait painter approach to draw clear picture, strategic picture and impose it to everybody. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Akita, for, for, this, for your points on the changing nature of the rivalry between uh, the US and China for, for the prospects. You argue that China is in a better position, so it will be certainly the, 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 the good way to, to start the discussion with uh, Renault, who may have another, another vision, and also for your, for your proposal at the end. So, Renault, I, I turn to you for seven minutes. Bon, je voudrais remercier les auditeurs qui ont eu le courage de se lever pour venir écouter cette session, qui est à session euh, qui tombe à point nommé avec la signature du traité euh, entre l'Australie, le Royaume-Uni et les États-Unis. Euh, donc l'Asie et la Chine. Euh, et là, évidemment, rivalité euh, sino-américaine. Ma thèse, c'est qu'en fait, la Chine... Euh, le micro ne marche pas. Est-ce que vous m'entendez là Non, en fait, si, était, si le technicien pouvait venir, voilà, merci. Vous pouvez m'enlever ça. Oui, et là, ça, ça marche là Oui, ça marche bien Non, non. Ah, vous vous entendez Bon, alors je vais parler au micro. Euh, donc toute ma thèse, en fait c'est que la Chine a commis une grave erreur stratégique. Son erreur stratégique a été de sortir du bois trop tôt. En stratégie, time is of the essence. Et là, je crois qu'elle est, euh, est sortie trop tôt. Quelle a été la stratégie après l'épisode maoïste marqué avant tout par la confrontation à l'égard de l'Occident, à l'égard de la France en Indochine, à l'égard de l'Amérique euh, au Vietnam, avec, à cause d'un facteur extérieur, l'Union soviétique, une euh, réconciliation tout à la fin du règne de Mao Tse-Tung. Euh, là, le remplaçant de Mao Tse-Tung, Deng Xiaoping, a fait une stratégie d'accommodement avec non seulement les puissances occidentales, et notamment l'Amérique, mais aussi avec les puissances asiatiques comme le Japon. Elle a beaucoup profité de la technologie japonaise pour son développement économique et euh, les... Euh, problèmes historiques avec le Japon n'ont pas été évoqués. 
quant aux îles Sinkaku, euh, elles avaient été mises sur l'étagère déjà lors de la première rencontre historique entre euh, le Premier ministre Tanaka et, euh, le, premier, euh, et le Premier ministre chinois Xuanlai. Euh, et donc, la Chine a conquis sa formidable puissance économique avec un modèle qui était très simple. Euh, nous sommes une puissance euh, pacifique. Nous entretenons de bonnes relations avec tout le monde. Il y a eu même une réconciliation avec l'Union soviétique. Vous vous souvenez du, visa, du voyage de Gorbatchev en 1989 à Pékin. Euh, mais nous sommes pauvres, donc aidez-nous. Nous sommes un grand pays. Et vous avez eu tout l'Occident et même toute l'Asie fascinés par la progression de la Chine, fascinés par ces Jeux olympiques somptueux qu'ils ont organisés, si je me souviens bien, en 2008, et qui, donc, euh, l'ensemble de l'Occident, l'ensemble même des puissances du monde, a aidé la Chine à se développer, la Chine se faisant passer pour euh, un pays euh, sous-développé qu'il fallait aider. Et là, d'ailleurs, elle a utiliser ce paradigme jusqu'au bout, si vous voulez, jusqu'à ce qu'on lui dise, écoutez, là, maintenant, ça suffit, euh, vous n'êtes pas un pays euh, sous-développé euh, et on ne peut plus vous considérer comme, euh, comme tel. Et, euh, et ça a marché. Mais euh, elle est sortie politiquement trop tôt du bois, c'est-à-dire que quand elle a tellement consolidé sa puissance économique qu'elle est devenue un peu arrogante. Et en fait, en stratégie, l'arrogance s'accommode très mal avec la puissance. Et ce qui est arrivé euh, à la Chine, comment est-elle sortie du bois Elle est sortie du bois pour des thèmes qui n'étaient pas essentiels pour elle, qui n'étaient pas des thèmes d'importance vraiment stratégique. Ça a été euh, les îlots... Euh, en mer de Chine orientale, donc une sorte de confrontation d'abord avec le Japon et parallèlement une confrontation avec les pays de l'Asie du Sud-Est puisqu'elle a voulu accaparer, elle a accaparé les, la mer de Chine méridionale en installant des aérodromes sur des récifs qui, jusque-là, étaient des terrae nullius en droit international, des, des îles inhabitées qui n'appartenaient à personne. Mais la Chine a accaparé euh, toute cette mer qui est plus grande que la Méditerranée. Et donc, aujourd'hui, elle considère que, c'est la, la, la théorie de la ligne des neuf traits, que euh, toute cette mer de Chine méridionale, qui va longer les côtes du Vietnam, aller en Malaisie, remonter sur Brunei, ensuite remonter sur les Philippines, euh, lui appartient et euh, elle donc, a accaparé tous ces, euh, tous ces récits. Euh, ça s'est d'ailleurs assez mal passé contre euh, les Vietnamiens au départ. Et ensuite, euh, M. Xi Jinping a promis aux Urbi et Torbi, c'était lors d'un voyage aux États-Unis, que jamais, euh, il a promis ça à M. Obama, que jamais il ne militariserait ces euh, îlots. Euh, dans les archipels qui s'appellent euh, Paracel et Spratleys, peu importe. Et bien, euh, il n'a pas tenu sa promesse, ça arrive à la Chine, euh, puisque aujourd'hui, ces îlots sont équipés de, de missiles et de bombardiers stratégiques. Euh, et cet aventurisme pour des des raisons qui sont importantes peut-être pour la Chine, mais qui ne sont pas essentielles, a tout d'un coup créé un mouvement de peur très important en Asie. L'Asie était plutôt prête à demander euh, aux Américains, qui ne souhaitaient pas forcément rester, de quitter ses bases. On a vu ça, par exemple, en Philippines. Et là, le mouvement a été entièrement inverse avec tous les pays asiatiques Asiatiques qui ont demandé davantage d'Amérique, davantage d'Amérique, s'il vous plaît, restez. Et même le Vietnam qui a invité, on se souvient, la visite d'Hillary Clinton au Vietnam et avec l'administration Obama 
qui a retiré euh, le Vietnam de, de la liste des pays à qui euh, l'Amérique ne pouvait pas fournir d'armement. Aujourd'hui, l'Amérique peut vendre tout à fait librement de l'armement euh, au Vietnam, euh, alors qu'évidemment, euh, il ne peut pas le faire euh, à l'égard de la Chine. C'est la même chose d'ailleurs pour, euh, pour l'Europe depuis euh, les, euh, la fin de l'Allemagne en 1989. Donc en fait, en, en sortant du bois trop tôt, en, en, en affirmant sa puissance, la Chine en fait aurait pu... Euh, a, 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 a manqué l'occasion, en fait, d'asseoir sa maîtrise de l'Asie. Parce que moi, je pense que stratégiquement, euh, la Chine n'a pas envie de conquérir le monde. La Chine n'a pas envie que Thomas euh, Gomard ou Renaud Girard vivent comme des Chinois. Euh, nous pouvons très bien euh, demeurer dans notre petit musée français, ça leur va très bien. Mais en revanche, je pense que la Chine veut être maître en Asie. Ça, c'est très clair. Et surtout, la Chine, et ça m'avait été confié par un vice-ministre chinois avec qui j'avais dîné en 2009, considère que l'Amérique n'a rien à faire, elle n'est pas chez elle en Asie, que l'Amérique n'a rien à faire depuis, je dirais, le golfe du Bengale jusqu'à l'île d'Hawaï, et que cette zone-là est très lointaine, c'est vrai qu'elle est lointaine géographiquement, est très lointaine de l'Amérique et qu'il n'y a rien à y faire. Et, mais en fait, en sortant du bois trop tôt, en étant trop « assertive », comme on dit en anglais, sur sa puissance, euh, la Chine a commis euh, une erreur stratégique. Elle a aliéné, en fait, elle a fait peur à tous les pays qui, jusque-là, euh, coopéraient euh, très volontiers avec elle, y compris le Japon, sur le plan euh, économique, et là, euh, elle a euh, provoqué une raideur et une peur de, euh, de tous ces pays. Euh, alors, il y a des pays qui sont euh, moins dépendants euh, de leur commerce avec la Chine, comme euh, le Japon, euh, qui ne dépend pas énormément, euh, euh, je, je crois que c'est seulement 4 ou 5 du PNB euh, japonais qui est fait d'exportation et d'importation de la Chine. En revanche, vous avez des pays qui sont beaucoup plus dépendants comme euh, la Corée, avec euh, le, le problème que la Chine a euh, été euh, extrêmement brutale à l'égard de la Corée, après que la Corée se fût équipée du système en, en, américain antiaérien, euh, antiaérien TAD. Alors je crois que, et, et nous avons eu, euh, là c'est ma, ma conclusion, nous avons eu, une nouvelle, un nouvel exemple d'arrogance euh, chinoise, et je le répète, l'arrogance va très mal avec la puissance. Plus vous êtes puissant, plus il faut être humble dans les relations internationales, sinon vous ne progressez plus. Et euh, là, la Chine euh, a été, est très, évidemment très puissante, elle va devenir automatiquement la première puissance économique mondiale, mais euh, elle n'a pas su... Rester plus humble, elle, elle s'est montrée arrogante. La dernière forme d'une arrogance incroyable, euh, c'est euh, cette affaire euh, du Covid, qui, à mon avis, euh, c'est évident, vient d'un accident industriel euh, à, à Wuhan, des expérimentations sur le, le transfert de, des coronavirus, des chauves-souris à l'espèce euh, humaine. Et lorsqu'elle a refusé une enquête euh, internationale, euh, sur l'origine du virus, alors que c'était un, une pandémie euh, internationale, et qu'elle a puni l'Australie, qui avait tout à fait naturellement, euh, euh, tout à fait naturellement demandé une enquête. Elle a perdu, on l'a la vu avec l'Ocus, euh, l'Australie. Euh, L'Australie était assez euh, proche de la Chine, avait un commerce très important avec la Chine. Aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment un rival stratégique de la Chine. Donc, euh, la Chine est sortie du bois trop tôt. L'arrogance en relation internationale va très mal avec la puissance. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Renaud. And I think it's a very good point of discussion with the presentation made by uh, Mr. Akita. So we will continue on that. But before that, Ambassador Lee, the floor is yours. Okay. Merci, Thomas. Vous m'entendez? Je suis très heureux avec vous ce matin ici à Abu Dhabi. Euh, 
Euh, je voudrais tout d'abord féliciter Thierry et son équipe d'IFRI de leur courage et de leur capacité de mettre en place cette conférence merveilleuse malgré de nombreuses euh, contraintes, obstacles sanitaires et logistiques. Bravo et merci. The expanding tension and conflict between the United States and China is much more serious concern to Korea than any other countries in the world because of history and geographical vicinity. The military alliance with the United States is a backbone of Korea's foreign policy, but we need to note that more than 30% of Korea's total export goes to China and Hong Kong, and Korea is the largest source of China's import. In addition, maybe more importantly, the U.S. and China are two indispensable partners for Korea to manage the threat from North Korea, maintaining peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula. It is almost impossible for Korea to segregate economic and geopolitical concerns, and I think the idea of eventual economic decoupling with China is a non-starter for Korea. Having that said, as an ally of the United States, Korea will follow the U.S. strategic trends, and it was reconfirmed at the face-to-face -face summit meeting of the two countries in May at the White House. However, it would be difficult for Korea to join any initiative explicitly targeting China, such as AUKUS. The international political order we want to see is non-exclusive, and we value highly the cooperation with all countries of the world because more than 90% of Korea's total GDP is generated from the external trade. Korea wants to remain a good and reliable partner of the United States without confronting and provoking China in the future. In response to the current geopolitical situation, Korean companies like Samsung, LG, SK, and Hyundai Motors are all trying to increase their investment in the United States and are currently examining how to change their current global supply chain. At the sideline of Korea-US summit meeting of May, those four companies announced the around 40 billion US dollars investment in the United States. This investment in the United States will allow those Korean companies to be able to produce high-end technology products in a trusted and predictable political and legal environment. Business leaders of Korea are well aware that U.S.-China conflict will continue, and it is a constant important factor in considering their business strategy. Now, I would like to briefly touch upon TPP and RCEP in the context of U.S.-China rivalry. I think the U.S. will come back to TPP, though not immediately. In case of U.S. return, it will play a very significant role in changing the current global supply chain dominated by China and to establish <coughs> international trade rules such as digital trade without China and even without the European Union. But the decision of the Biden administration regarding TPP will be most likely made after midterm election of next year because trade is not so popular issue in the domestic politics and does not help to increase supporting votes in the election. In case U.S. returns, however, it will not return to TPP of 2016, but it will propose TPP plus 
based on the provisions of USMCA and strengthen the labor and environment as well as digital trade and climate change provisions. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, whose negotiation began in 2011, was signed in November last year among ASEAN 10 plus five countries without India. However, the agreement is not so commercially meaningful in substance because its level of liberalization, both in goods and services, remains almost unchanged from the current ones provided by the already existing bilateral FTAs between the signatories. Even the prospect of its entry into force is not so clear yet. It requires ratification of at least six ASEAN countries and three non-ASEAN countries for the entry into force. As for non-ASEAN countries, China and Japan have already ratified the agreement and Korea plans to do so before end of the year. For ASEAN, it seems rather complicated. Myanmar may not be able to ratify soon because of a recent political situation. Malaysia is not likely as well because it recently becomes rather negative to the trade liberalization agreement. We have to note that Malaysia and Brunei have not ratified even CPTPP, TPP 11 yet. It would take rather long time for the agreement to enter into force in case U.S. raise concerns or U.S. comes back to TPP. Ironically, the fact that RCEP is not so commercially meaningful can be a reason why U.S. may not care much about the RCEP, but the political and symbolic importance may matter more to the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lee. <coughs> and I think uh, one of uh, your main points is to, to remind this uh, uh, wish for, for Korea to, to stay in line with the U.S. without provoking China, its um, balanced position. So I turn now to uh, Mr. Narayanan. Uh, you have the floor, Ambassador. Narayanan. Excuse me for the pronunciation. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I feel particularly privileged to be present on this occasion because I think of all the, of all the uh, continents, perhaps Asia is the one racked with the largest number of rivalries. Uh, before I take up the subject proper, may I echo what Ambassador Lee said about Monzia theory and its remarkable efforts in putting together the 14th edition of Global Governance. It is, I would say, a most magnificent effort, but I'm sure that Monsieur Thierry and his team, SNK and Com have done a great job. Thank you very much, Ambassador Thierry, for what you've done. Uh, as is aware, as aware from the, <clears throat> what the previous speakers said, there are many more rivalries in Asia other than the one between the U.S. and China. Some are of much longer standing in many ways, but each of them are important for the future of Asia and perhaps to, for some, to some extent for the future of the world itself. We have seen some of them turn into bitter wars, Vietnam earlier, Afghanistan more recently. <clears throat> but under the surface, I would like to say that each of the rivalries have the potential to turn into major conflicts. And I think this subject is particularly important for every nation of the world, apart from those in Asia, to ponder over and try to arrive at certain basic tenets as to how to overcome the situation. Uh, before take, uh, moving over to Sino-US uh, Sino rivalry, let me take and view the issue from, the, from an Indian perspective. From, for India, there are two major conflicts 
that it of two major rivalries that affect its future. The Sino-Indian uh, rivalry and of course the India-Pakistan tensions and conflicts. We had thought that after many years of intense <clears throat> bickerings and conflicts, we had reached a plateau as far as Sino-Indian tensions were concerned. But in the course of the last 18 months, we have seen a flare-up of the Sino-Indian tension with the Chinese unprovoked aggression in the Galwan Heights in Ladakh. And it's obvious, therefore, that China will never allow any of its, na of its neighbors to live in peace. I will revert to that a few minutes later. But there's another 400-pound gorilla in the room, the India-Pakistan conflict. And that, again, has an, is an unending saga of conflict and tensions, resolutions, etc. So the basic issue that India uh, Asia conference is a series of conflicts. We've heard Ambassador Lee and others talk about <clears throat> other issues. But I, if I might say so, I would say that from the point of view of world peace, the China-Taiwan conflict, and I would say the Sino-Indian conflicts are perhaps the ones with the maximum potential for a worldwide configuration. And I think it's important that this conference uh, deals with some aspects of this. The point I would stress is that there are, there are few pointers to what exactly China wants other than dominant over Asia as a first step in dominate the rest of the world. And I think we should flag this point. <clears throat> Otherwise, as I said, there was no reason in the spring of 2020 for China to have done what it did in the Galwan Heights. Therefore, I think checkmating China's ambitions or expansionist ambitions is crucial for the future of Asia, if not the world. I would uh, sense that we, we, we need to be clear what exactly Sino-US rivalry is about. Is it to checkmate the, uh, China alone, or is it that the US does not wish to have another nation confronting its, what I would say, the, the, being the number one power in the world? All that I would like to say is that the fact that China is a common factor in most conflicts in Asia, and perhaps in other areas as well, reminds me, at least, and I hope the audience will go along with this, of Francis Fukuyama's warning that the new global strategic threat comes not from Islamic terror, but from China. I think we should heed this. The world must accept this innate wisdom, because I think it, it contains a lot of uh, important ideas for the world. Talk of Sino-American rivalry should factor this aspect into calculation and not see it as a mere rivalry between China and the United States. It encompasses the rest of the world as well. On this point, let me strike a jarring note. It's all very well to talk of US-China rivalries. But if the United States is keen to checkmate China's expansionist ambitions, is it willing to go the whole, whole way? There have been periods in the past when the United States has talked of checkmating China. We have seen the pivot to Asia at the, or towards the end of the, of the century. But as each China, U.S. Ad, uh, administration changes, there's a change in attitude, there's a change in perspectives, there's a change in objectives. And therefore, we have seen the United States receding, many Asian countries which have lined up with the United States being caught off in the wrong foot, while China keeps going ahead, expanding its ambit of uh, authority and power and moving further and further afield. So when we talk of Sino-U.S. rivalry, and if, I would like this audience to really say, how far will the United States be willing to go? Are they again, we are we going to see the Biden administration do what Barack Obama said, what my good friend Hillary Clinton said about the, the pivot to Asia, etc. We need an objective. I, I'm very clear in my life. I live 
in Asia. I've dealt with China after, for the better part of nearly 50 years in my official and semi-official capacities. I understand China. I've studied Chinese communism. But there's one thing, whether it's Chinese communist or Chinese nationalist, China wishes to dominate the world. We may accept that position, we may accept Nostradamus, who thinks that a yellow race will dominate the world, or we need to start thinking about it. And I think Monsieur Thierry and, and uh, others who have thought of the subject need to look at this point. So, I would say that Asia by itself cannot withstand China. India is about the only country in, in this region which has the, the capacity to stand up to China. But what China has done by virtue of the, its so-called strategic imperatives, Belt Road Initiative, etc., is to confuse the rest of Asia and tell them that we are offering you so much in terms of economic and other words. And in, in the process, as we heard yesterday, they have taken over large parts of territory across the world. They have more or less kept many countries of Asia completely sort of in their thrall, economically and otherwise. And as we saw in, in Afghanistan, for instance, many Asian countries require Western involvement to even protect the democratic traditions that they've been used to. So I, I think I'm running short, but I just want to ask this question because I think it's a little jarring. Is the United States willing to bite the bullet? Will they walk the talk? We don't want another repeat of what happened in 1999, 2000, 2001. The concerns that many people have about China are real, but given the historical events of recent decades, Vietnam is maybe in the past, but Afghanistan is right there just a few uh, weeks back. So. Can we expect the United States to do something or not? Or are we going to just talk about it, we'll talk in these fora, and what not? People are now talking of the Quad. India is a part of the Quad. But Quad is a plurilateral grouping. It's not really a security. And I've been part of many of these discussions. I don't really think that the Quad is capable of putting its shoulder to the wheels to protect. Then now you've got AUKUS. Is AUKUS going to be Thing. We, have seen, we have seen many other groupings of this kind, but it ultimately is a matter of resolve. It's a matter of resolution. And I'm some, I, I am convinced that somehow the American people are not ready to, to sort of pay the penalties or the water they profit for what they have to do if they wish to take on. And my good friends, the British, did, that, did much more. So just one minute more. And I therefore say that what we require is a display of determination by the United States. Because if the United States is not present sign, uh, in, in the conflict, Sino-US rivalry will then finally dissipate after everything. And the Chinese will have everything that goes there they want to have. How do we implement these plans? We've already seen the bruja that has taken place about uh, AUKUS, what has AUKUS has done, and France has stepped back, etc. We want a clear, determined effort on the part of the free world to really come forward and say, can we prevent Chinese expansionism, which is the biggest shadow over Asia? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and for having reminded us that there is not only the rivalry between the US and China in Asia, plus what you have said about the US and um, to expect maybe a more cautious US uh, be, be behavior in the future. So it's a good, a good opportunity to turn to Marcus Noland, who is uh, on visio with us uh, this morning. Uh, Marcus, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I would like to join my predecessors in thanking uh, Thierry and the WP staff for again putting on a wonderful program. I recently had surgery, which prevents me from traveling, and uh, I hope to be able to rejoin you in person in the future. The situation in the United States is concerning. 
we have mounted a mediocre pandemic response. The conduct of the Afghanistan withdrawal left much to be desired. We have a narrowly divided Congress engaged in financial brinkmanship. And we face a basic issue of credibility associated with the likelihood that the Democrats will lose one or both houses of Congress next year, creating paralysis. And in 2024, we face the possible return of Donald Trump and wholesale policy reversal. President Biden has a radically different public persona than former President Trump. And his trajectory on domestic policy is significantly different. However, in foreign policy, there has been more continuity than one might have expected. This in part reflects a tendency within the American political system to devalue efforts to sustain international institutions and cooperation and to prioritize domestic policy concerns. While the United States is deeply polarized politically, Across the political spectrum, American attitudes <laughs> towards China have been poisoning at both the elite and mass level. That consensus appears to be largely attributable to the perception that the government of China is engaged in increasingly repressive behavior in the, internally, as well as, aggre uh, as aggressive external behavior. This shift is not uniquely American, Polling done by Pew Research indicates that negative appraisals of China are widespread, including in, China, in Asia. In terms of U.S. policy, for example, with respect to Taiwan, the Biden administration has conducted high-level meetings with Taiwanese officials and has begun talks on a trade and investment framework or TPA agreement. It has kept most of the Trump administration's tariff and export controls in place. It is grappling with how to address, best address the issue of Chinese industrial subsidies and state-owned enterprises. The Biden administration has criticized China over its refusal to cooperate on a rigorous independent investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 virus. And it has reaffirmed the Trump administration's characterization of the situation in Xinjiang as genocide. And like the Trump administration has admonished China for its violation of the one country system principle in Hong Kong. With the revival of the Quad and the recent AUKUS submarine deal, the U.S. is trying to constitute a military alliance to balance China in the Indo-Pacific region. A problem with this strategy is that China is the leading trade partner for most countries in the region. And the U.S. moves are not being accompanied by a robust economic policy component. The result is that countries are feeling the centripetal pull of the Chinese economy are being put in the difficult position of choosing between uh, political and military interests and their pocketbooks. In Australia's case, it has been the object of hardball Chinese actions in the economic sphere, which have contributed to a significant hardening of the Australian public's attitude towards China. Similar stories of Chinese economic pressure followed by uh, shifts in public attitudes can be told for Japan and for South Korea. In this context, China's announcement that it wanted to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, has wrong-footed the US. For domestic political reasons, the Biden administration will have difficulty countering this move. Historically, Republicans in the U.S. have tended to be pro-trade, while Democrats were the more skeptical of globalization. The Trump takeover of the Republican Party has flipped that identification. Now Republicans are more trade skeptical, while a plurality of Democrat-affiliated voters are pro-trade. Biden and the Democratic Party are beholden to the unions, which are traditionally protectionist, however. So today in Congress, a coalition of Republicans and the so-called progressive wing of the Democratic Party can block trade initi initiatives such as U.S. accession to CPTPP. If the Chinese application to join CPTPP moves forward, and I believe it ultimately will, uh, this could create a crisis moment for the WTO. The trade policy action will have shifted to CPTPP without the United States 
or EU involvement. One foreign policy area where the Biden administration policy differs markedly from the previous administration is with respect to climate change. And here, China and the rest of Asia are central. China and India alone are projected to account for half of the increase in global energy consumption to 2040. In terms of CO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants and train, China accounts for 54%, Indonesia 11%, Indonesia 7%. So together, these three Asian countries account for 71% of the projected increase from CO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants. So any solution to climate change has to include China. The outstanding issue is whether the U.S. and China can cooperate on issues such as climate change while continuing um, to work together on more problematic issues such as North Korea, where their, their interests do not entirely align, while disagreeing on other matters, including sensitive domestic policy uh, issues such as genocide in Xinjiang. Um, the Biden administration wants to pursue this kind of multifaceted approach, but the evidence is thin uh, as to whether such an approach can be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, for having reminded us the importance of the domestic factors within the U.S. system and also the continuity uh, of its uh, foreign policy regarding um, Asia and China in, in particular. Uh, it's time now to, to turn to uh, Professor Wang Jizi, uh, who participated in the session yesterday. So, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I'm happy to join others, although I'm not able to join you physically. I hope I will be, uh, be with you in person in the future. Uh, you ask good questions, but I cannot give you a very good As some people have said, uh, China is rising it's strong materially, but in public perceptions of China around the world, the, uh, the picture is mixed. Many media reports indicate that public opinion polls in the Western countries, Japan, South Korea, and India are increasingly vulnerable unfavorable to China. Uh, recently, I heard that Mr. Kishida may be elected prime minister in Japan soon. Uh, it is related to what he and other Japanese see today's China. He was elected, and he was educated in America he is pragmatic, but probably unsympathetic to China's political values. And I would like to know my South Korean colleague how he will uh, assess the uh, upcoming election of South Korea. And the next uh, president of South Korea may have another <coughs> approach to China. Last week, the leaders of the four nations that make up the informal grouping, the United States, Japan, India, and Australia, known as Quad, met for the first time in person at the White House. Its unstated goal is to stop China from becoming Asia's undisputed hegemon. There have been other events and developments in recent months, not in favor of China. But they are hardly reported in China itself and hardly known to the general public in China. China's media is full of triumphalism, meaning we are winning, we are winning, and we are winning. We have friends all over the world praising our achievements. 
This self-image makes it difficult for Beijing to show any similar attitude toward whoever viewed as hostile to China. I don't see any prospects that Beijing would back down on major foreign policy issues and become less assertive, but as, at least in rhetoric. Our, uh, our French participant asked China to be humble, but I don't, like, I, I don't see the likelihood of being humble for China in the near future. China and the United States have been engaged in a protracted strategic competition that may last for decades. However, at this moment, both Beijing and Washington are preoccupied with their respective domestic imperatives. <clears throat> On the Chinese side, we have electric out outage in many provinces, especially in the northwest, northeast. The debt crisis regarding Evergrande is another example of China's weakness. The most damaging problem is the slowing down of economic growth. There are issues related to the increasing fertility rate and the aging population. It is difficult to achieve the goal of common prosperity when economic growth is slower, private owned enterprises are depressed and not doing well, and social safety net has not been remarkably improved. In the US side, we see continued political polarization, the fighting back for the Democrats, for the Republic uh, in Congress and in White uh, infrastructure construction, uh, pandemic control, illegal immigration, uh, uh, gun control, corporate, to name just a, say, uh, a few. So I envisage, envisage a temporary state in the bilateral relationship between China and the United States. Or this in the comes in the months ahead. I don't urge bilateral issues emerging. But I don't see this as improvement. There can be instance, the uh, assumption of, of consulates in Houston and Chengdu. There could also be economic dialogue at high levels between the two countries. However, three possible problems are lying ahead for China in the next few months. First, the continued U.S. effort to tr trace the origins of COVID-19 that worries China. Second, the Winter Olympic Games. The Western countries are not going to boycott the games, but they are uh, the public opinion polls show that the, the, uh, these countries are, are not sympathetic and they may not be uh, wholeheartedly support the uh, games. And that could be the uh, embarrassed time. <clears throat> Third, there is the talk about the democratic summit toward the end of the year. And that is, of course, not very favorably received in China. Especially China's concern about Taiwan's participation in the summit. Maybe not uh, President Tsai ing wen or some top leaders, but even a, a lower level participation will annoy China. We have seen the insignification of China's propaganda war, both at home and internationally, against the United States. We see reports on racial tensions, gun control issues, bad management pandemic, human rights violations in the United States, and international failures like in Afghanistan. But the propaganda campaign is directed more at domestic audiences 
to enhance their confidence in the Communist Party, rather than at international audiences for them to have a better understanding or positive understanding of China. So I see China's international behavior as mostly defensive in nature. I don't buy the theory that China desires to buy to be the, the hegemon of the world or even of Asia. As I say in my recent articles, I think the Chinese-US competition is um, basically a game between the domestic order maintained by the Communist Party of China and the international order maintained and advocated by the United States. So in the United States, you see America first as a slogan. But in China, my or the slogan I always hear, comes party first. So I see a US-China trade volume increase last year, and climate change, the effort on China is serious. I'm more worried about technological decoupling. Thomas mentioned the chips. That is a real issue in the US-China relationship. And also there is a possible cyber war. I'm not much worried about confrontation, despite the increased militant uproars among some Chinese netizens and some commentators. Uh, we know that Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, last year made a phone call to his Chinese counterpart to uh, prevent a war between the two sides. And there will be improved crisis management arrangements between the two sides. I think the Taiwan policy of China is consistent. Uh, Xi Jinping made a, uh, a telegram to his counterpart the uh, chairman of the Kuomintang in Taiwan, and he said and, uh, uh, Taiwan should uh, engage each other for a peaceful solution. Of course, China will upgrade its, its military preparedness. There yeah. could be air fighters and bombers and uh, flying over uh, Taiwan or near Taiwan, things like that. But I don't see a real war between the two sides. Professor, when we talk about Professor, yes. Professor Wang yes. I'm afraid I, I have to, to interrupt you. I will okay. be back. I will, I will be back to you just to word, the, yes, the just last, to to respect the, last the, sentence. the time constraint. But uh, last sentence. as uh, as Marcus Noland uh, insisted on the. Uh, uh, the domestic factors. I, I think also what you have said about the Chinese opinion is very uh, useful to, to, to fuel our, our, our debates. To continue, um, I would like to, to ask two questions to the panelists, because there is this point of disagreement uh, between um, uh, Mr. Akita and Renaud Girard about, uh, about China. For, for Mr. Akita, China is in a better position and uh, for Renault, uh, in a sense, China is in a worst uh, position. So my first question is for the three of our panelists. After AUKUS, how do you assess Chinese position? Is it better or is it, uh, is it uh, worse? So that's, for the, for, that's for my first question. The second one is addressed to Mr. Akita and um, Renaud Girard in line with uh, the, the last words by uh, Professor Wang Jizi about Taiwan, because you, you, don't, you, don't, you, didn't, uh, you have not sorry, elaborated uh, in your uh, various statement about Taiwan, and I, I would be interested in knowing your respective views on, on that. <laughs> so maybe to start with Ambassador Li about uh, China position, um, what do you, how do you assess it? My opinion, I think there is no change for China. It is a kind of anticipated path. Because the Biden 
stress the importance of enlisting partners and allies in his combat against China, even before he took office. So that is the way we anticipated, in a way to, to enlist uh, partners and allies. And uh, which is uh, interesting to me is the, the drastic change of United Kingdom's positions. Mm-hmm. UK was first European countries to support uh, AIDB a month ahead of expression of support by France, Germany, and Italy. But now they joined the camp of the United States in dealing with China. Mm -hmm. I think that is because of uh, Hong Kong issues. Um, I think uh, China now tried to avoid isolation. One way of this is to apply for CPTPP knowing that it will not be possible for China to join the CPTPP because the CPTPP for uh, TPP is uh, unanimous consent is required to accept the new members. At this moment, it is impossible for TPP 11 countries to give unanimous support to China. But however, China has nothing to lose in applying for the CPTPP because if denied, it is the, the fault of CPTPP who refuse China's effort to join international effort for further liberalization of trade. So I think uh, uh, with the regard to AUKUS, China's effort to out of isolation will continue. Thank you very much. So, but this, this first question, this very first question about your assessment of Chinese position, is it better or is it, is it more, more difficult for China right now? I, I have a rather uh, conflictual position. <clears throat> China is strong, but I think it's also at one of its peak moments. I, I see the... Uh, that there are in, it's not the United States or the rest of the world which is going to be a problem for, the, for China. I think it is certain inner tensions within the Chinese Communist Party which are not yet apparent. <clears throat> in some ways, I see Xi Jinping's position with what Mao's position was in 1958-59. There are tensions. There are many things that Xi is doing, which of course the democratic world sees uh, difficult, but I think in the Chinese Communist Party, there are many who feel that in a bid to, to ram, uh, for sure, ram through a whole lot of uh, ideas, plans, when it's for his own position for the future, his own thoughts for the future, if I might say so, there are tensions. I think it would well worth re- the democratic world to see that, rather than I think the AUKUS and the Quad and the, all the various, the other trade tensions that are present. I think these are not going to make me. Can we, can we widen the fault lines within the Chinese Communist Party, which are not too apparent, mm-hmm. are apparent, I'm sure, to more detailed scholars than myself? How do we use that? How do we exploit it? I think that probably is far better than sending um, five squadrons of, the, of militarily equipped uh, planes and whatnot. So I, I think there is something which I have not seen it, but I, I, I live in, in India. I don't see as much of scholarly dissertation on what are the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party tension. It used to be, we used to get much more in the past. It's not apparent. But from what I see, there is something which is there, and I think it's well worth, and maybe this could be the theme for the next major dissertation of the of global governance of, of the Thank you. Okay. I, I return to Professor Wang Jizi on this uh, first question. I w- would be interested in, uh, in, in having your, your assessment, Professor. Are you s- so first question. I didn't hear you. Ah, okay. So, you know, there was, there was a point of discussion at the beginning of our session between uh, Mr. Akita and Girard 
for Mr. Akita, uh, China is in a better position. And for uh, Renaud Girard, China is in a more difficult uh, position. And uh, what is your views on that? Okay. Uh, I think uh, China is uh, in a difficult position to expand its influence. Its material power is very strong. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I turn to my second question, uh, which is uh, focused on, on, on Taiwan. So, Rono, if you can go first, and I will um, turn to Mr. Akita afterwards. Je pense qu'en fait, dans ce grand match qui s'inscrit dans l'histoire, parce qu'à un moment on a cru que euh, la rivalité sino-américaine euh, était due simplement à Trump. On voit qu'en fait euh, Biden continue totalement euh, la politique de Trump à l'égard euh, de la Chine. Donc c'est quelque chose qui s'inscrit dans un grand mouvement historique. Je pense que, avec notamment la, la signature de ce traité AUKUS, je pense qu'en fait, la Chine a perdu un premier set, c'est un match de tennis au moins en 5-7, comme à Wimbledon. La Chine a perdu le premier set, mais elle n'a pas perdu le match. Je pense que L'objectif principal de Xi Jinping, je ne sais pas s'il si va vouloir rester au pouvoir au-delà de euh, 2027. Je crois que s'il veut rester au-delà de 2027, il devra changer les statuts du Parti communiste chinois. Enfin, euh, ça ne le gênera pas trop, parce qu'il a déjà euh, changé euh, la constitution. Mais je pense que son objectif principal, ce qu'il veut léguer à la Chine, de son passage au pouvoir, c'est la récupération de Taïwan. Je pense que même sa frise chez lui a l'obsession, sinon ces manœuvres aériennes, ce viol assez fréquent du, de l'espace aérien taïwanais par les avions de chasse chinois n'aurait strictement aucun sens. Donc je crois que c'est... Euh, mais euh, mais je ne pense pas que dans ce conflit, la Chine souhaite livrer bataille. La Chine, depuis Sun Tzu, veut gagner les guerres sans livrer bataille. Donc je ne vois pas du tout une bataille de la guerre de Corail, une bataille de Midway pour euh, le contrôle de Taïwan. Je vois plutôt une stratégie... Euh, sur deux axes. Le premier axe est évidemment une cinquième colonne à l'intérieur de Taïwan grâce au parti Kuomintang qui s'affaiblit euh, par rapport au parti de Madame Tsai mais qui est quand même très présent. Je crois qu'il y a une vraie politique euh, de la Chine continentale à l'égard du parti euh, du Kuomintang à, à Taïwan. Et la deuxième politique, c'est effectivement c'est une politique de patience. Nous allons attendre, nous, Chinois, que les Américains se lassent. Nous les avons vus se lasser en Indochine et finalement abandonner l'Indochine après être arrivé en Indochine vers 1955, comme le raconte le roman Un Américain bien tranquille. Ils sont partis en 75. Ils ont tout laissé. Ils se sont, nous, avons, nous, Chinois, nous les avons vus euh, se lasser en Mésopotamie. Ils ont fait toute une intervention. Nous les avons vus se lasser euh, en Afghanistan. Euh, finalement, nous avons vu les Américains donner, après l'invasion de l'Irak, euh, l'Irak à l'Iran. Et puis nous, 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 nous les remercions parce qu'ils ils viennent de nous donner sur un plateau d'argent l'Afghanistan avec tous ses métaux rares et son lithium. Et euh, ça va nous permettre à nous, Chinois, de faire notre route 
de la soie à travers l'Afghanistan. Donc, en fait, je pense que le calcul chinois, c'est simplement d'avoir une patience stratégique et de faire d'attendre que les Américains, pour une raison ou pour une autre, qui peut être une raison de politique intérieure américaine, que les Américains se retirent et que donc les Taïwanais comprennent qu'ils n'ont pas d'autre choix que rejoindre euh, la Chine et négocier le maximum d'autonomie. Et c'est comme ça, je pense, que la Chine a envie euh, de, avec évidemment la construction d'une marine extrêmement forte pour intimider, avec la poursuite évidemment de la cyberguerre, parce que les Chinois font une cyberguerre permanente, pas seulement comme le, contre l'Australie en ce moment, mais aussi évidemment pour espionner en France et aux états unis euh, la cyberguerre et chez les Chinois est euh, permanente, mais c'est une stratégie de rapport de force. Je ne pense pas qu'on va vers la guerre chaude, la guerre navale, telle qu'on avait connue dans la première guerre du Pacifique. Cette guerre, cette deuxième guerre du Pacifique qui a commencé est une guerre de rapport de force, une guerre d'intimidation euh, avec l'usage de la okay. cyberguerre et qui a pour but d'obtenir que les Taïwanais eux-mêmes se livrent euh, à la Chine simplement au regard des rapports de force. Ce que tu nous rappelles, c'est que le cinquième set se joue au tie-break. Voilà. Donc, euh, Mr. Akita, what, what are your views on, on, on Taiwan? Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Before I go to Taiwan, I, let me briefly elaborate uh, the, why I think China is in a favorable position. Uh, if I put China as a person, China has a big muscle, China has more money, and China lives in a more favorable geopolitical location. So I think China is in a favorable position. But also, China has a full of problem inside his family. Like an income gap, like a person once said, shortage of electricity, and also a lack of the social welfare system. So I think that in the long run, uh, China is a decline. China will be a declining empire, and also the instability of the political system will arise. But in the long run, I think that China will lose the favorability. So that's why China tried to do everything they can do now. So that is my point. And on Taiwan, I, I echo uh, a French participant's uh, analysis. I don't think that China have uh, enough capability to guarantee itself to win the full-scale war. China can destroy Taipei or China can land on Taiwan, but uh, it doesn't have sufficient military power to take over Taiwan by resisting all kind of counter-attack from US or other allies. So I think there are two likely scenarios. First scenario is uh, similar to Russian uh, hybrid war against Crimea 2014. So ch China may conduct massive cyber attack or cut under sea cable and to disrupt Taiwan or you know, spread fake news so that they can weaken the Taiwan political entity gradually, and then uh, find some chance in the long run to annex Taiwan. But another scenario is a 1937 Japan and China scenario. Japan and China didn't have an intention to fight total uh, full-scale war, but uh, triggering, triggered by the conflict at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing. Uh, both countries uh, uh, gradually engaged into a full-scale war. So there is a risk that due to the miscalculation, US and China will uh, face uh, 
serious conflict without uh, intention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are ending the, this, uh, this session. I would like to thank, of course, all the, all the panelists for uh, their contribution. I think it was very uh, substantial because we had the chance to have a, a view from, uh, from Europe, a view from Japan, a view from Korea, a view from, uh, from India, and a view from, uh, from the US and from uh, China. So thank you for all of us, and I would suggest to applaud you and to, to, to be back for the next session. Thank you very much.